Hi, good afternoon to all of you. Let's begin. So first of all, um, uh, me, Ramashankar Pandey from uh, uh, Hela India Lighting, as well as from Auto Component Manufacturing Association. We are actually delighted at what we could do with uh, ET Auto today, thanks to the whole team of ET Auto. If you look at the topic, it talks about the untangling as well as it talks about the operational concerns. So today's webinar will focus more uh, from that angle, that for practitioner, for all of us, because GST is no more in the uh, you know three months or four months kind of timeline we have, we have very quick, so it is already on. And that's why operationalizing it becomes a major concern for most of the industry people. So today what we will see this topic is untangling the operational concerns around goods and services tax, where Dr. Sanjeev Agarwal readily agreed to help us out. So first of all, thank you, sir, to join us. And uh, today we are actually, uh, yeah, we are actually looking at how, whatever is going in our mind, whatever difficulty we are facing, because the difficulty already started, we already started facing. Uh, if you look at GST as such, of course, in mid long term, it is bringing a lot of benefits to us, a lot of benefits to the industry and Sanjeev ji is, uh, is a, a kind of practitioner is very close to because he is also fellow member for uh, from the ICAI uh, he has authored three books on GST which brings a lot of credibility uh, what is bringing to the table today and he has already organized more than a dozen of uh, workshops which also gives us that roughly it's already coming up the mature uh, views which will come today a uh, little bit before we start I just wanted to uh, revised because all of know all of us know in fact what GST brings us to but it's a lot, lot of benefits to us as an auto component and automotive industry it is bringing of course the reduction of all the multiplicity of taxes it will give us a very nice transportation uh, or the free possibility in future it will improve our efficiency overall because as the cascading tax effects will be now um, uniformized and these great system will come like any other part of the world we will also have an efficient system but even for consumers, we are expecting a lot of benefits will come in terms of transparency of taxes, in terms of simplifying the taxes. But overall, everything, it will make India as one market. That's a, that's a father or mother of all reforms in terms of uh, taxes and what we see. So with that positive note or good news that the GST is around the corner, we all are seeing the, the long-term benefit of that. And of course, we will all uh, uh, take this challenge of short-term transition difficulties in and way to, you know, we'll find a way to sort it out. Let's begin this. So over to you, Sanjeevji. Let's start with the, uh, we'll have roughly 30 minutes of this um, uh, presentation. And after that, we'll actually open up for questions. Some of the questions what we received, we have taken care that while we are presenting, we'll be able to talk about it. And later, what is not answered, we will take questions one by one. And if there are not a question of similar nature, we'll try to phrase it and put it to Dr. Adar. Over to you, Sanjeevji. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Pandey. Uh, it is nice to be there on the ET webinar. Uh, you rightly said that the uh, topic for today is very apt. Where the GHG is around the corner. If July is going to, it's going to be July. Then it's hardly uh, 28 days now left for the GHG, and all of us should are geared up for uh, preparing for the GHG. Uh, as you said, uh, we'll have a half an hour presentation where I'll, wherein I'll give you a brief overview to all the attendees uh, about uh, what's going to be there in the GHG. So starting with the basic, and then uh, we'll try to cover what are the what could be the operational issues in relation to the automobile industries, automobile dealers, and uh, auto component manufacturers. So we begin with this. Uh, my presentation would basically covering registration, composition, uh, invoices, uh, how to deal with the you know the transactions with the unregistered uh, persons, handling closing stocks, uh, what would be the relevant documents, what are the specific issues in this. So, as we all know, the automobile sector contributes over 7% to the GDP, so it becomes very important for the automobile industry as such, uh, so far as their contribution to GST is concerned, and also to the government of India, because a lot of revenue is being is, is coming from the this sector, and the contribution is also substantial, 7% is not a small contribution to the GDP. Uh, if you look at the fiscal of 2016-17, there were a few events which uh, you know positively or negatively impacted the automobile industry one was good monsoon which uh, uh, brought in a lot of lot of uh, revenue and sales to the uh, sector demonetization yes one one issue which uh, which had a negative slightly negative impact and uh, uh, if you look at the figures which have recently been uh, uh, announced two days back 7.1 percent is the growth of uh, gdp in the last fiscal then there was a supreme court ruling uh, on bs3 vehicles which also had a uh, a little bit of negative setback. 
Uh, when we talk of G GDP, the one good thing is that, you know, if you look at this uh, diagram, we have 18% from agriculture, 25% from manufacturing sector, and 57% from uh, the service sector. With GST, what is going to happen, uh, minus the agricultural sector, entire 82% of the Indian GDP will only be having one indirect tax, one major indirect tax, and that is going to be GST. So the one good thing that a lot of indirect taxes get subsumed in the uh, GST. We have uh, the provisions, of, we have the uh, taxation uh, taxations, uh, laws which are, uh, you know, administered by central government. We have the uh, tax laws which are uh, governed by the state governments, and these are the taxes which are presently being levied by the union government. It is income tax, excise duty, custom service tax, central service tax, and certain other cesses and stamp duties. So what is going to happen is, you know, the excise duty and uh, service tax are the two major taxes which will be subsumed in the GST. If you look at the state taxes, VAT is the most important tax which goes into the GST. And apart from that, there are certain other taxes like octra will be there, anti tax will be there, certain other luxury taxes, entertainment taxes, they also get subsumed. All right. Presently, what is happening is, you know, the, the taxation in India is uh, origin-based tax. It is based on the activity. Like, if there is an activity of manufacturing and the goods are removed from the factory, you, we are paying excise duty. When you are rendering the services, you are paying service tax. And when there is sale of goods, there is a uh, VAT which is levied. In case it is an interest transaction, it is uh, central system which is levied. So there is going to be a complete shift from this part of taxation because the base of consumption base of taxation will shift from origin to the uh, origin to the consumption and it will become a destination based tax in the gst region what is gst it is basically a common tax on goods and services so there won't be any separate taxes for, on goods and separate taxes on services we will have only one tax in the country when gst comes in and there is one thing which all of us as professionals and uh, taxpayers should welcome now, before I move further, it is important to note what goes into the GST. The taxes which will be subsumed in the GST could be central taxes and it could be state taxes. The taxes which are getting subsumed in GST, so far as central taxes are concerned, are the central excise duty, the duties of excise which are levied under the Medicinal and Toilet Preparations Act of 1954. Then we have various additional duties are there, additional duties of customs, we call it CVD. Special additional duties of customs, ADC would also get subsumed service tax and various surcharges. So far as state taxes are concerned, VAT, central service tax, purchase tax, entertainment tax, amusement tax, luxury tax, lottery tax, entry taxes, and taxes on advertisement and certain cesses. They, are, they got they go subsumed into the GST. Uh, one point here to be noted here is that in case of uh, local body taxes, which are the taxes not levied by the state government, those taxes will not get subsumed. So this is one point which, which may bother the taxpayers. So far as the taxes which don't go into the G, into the GST are concerned, the basic indirect tax is the customs duty. The basic customs duty will not get subsumed, though the additional duties and special duties of customs are getting subsumed. Then uh, duties on excise duty on tobacco products, specific central cesses uh, on uh, like such as oil cess, taxes on petroleum products, stamp duties, anti-dumping duties, they will not form part of the GST. So far as state taxes are concerned, taxes on liquor, because it is a state subject and central central government cannot levy a tax on liquor. So it is the state government which levies a tax on, tax on liquor and those taxes are also not getting subsumed. Toll tax, road tax, environment tax, taxes on properties, tax on consumption of uh, sale of electricity, stamp duty, purchase tax on food grains, the taxes on motor speed and high speed diesel, they will also not get subsumed. Now, if you look at what's, what's going to be uh, there in GST, today you are, we are paying taxes on goods, we are paying taxes on services. So instead of that, we'll pay taxes, uh, tax called GST, and that GST can be in a different form. For, uh, the tax which is levied by central government will be called central GST. The tax which is levied by state government will be called state GST. And if it is an interstate transaction, it will be called IGST, that is the integrated GST. Where the states are not involved and union territory is involved, we have seven union territories in the country. In that case, the SGST will be called UTGST. In any case, SGST and UTGST could never be imposed together. So it is either IGST or a combination of CGST and SGST. Now, the, one of the major operational issues which is going to come in, in the GST regime is like who administers whom. This is a basic question which is open, is still open. The council, though they have decided that the taxpayers would be administered both by the central government and by the state government. And the formula which they've arrived at is that for the for a taxpayer with turnover below 1.5 crores, 90% would be administered by states and 10% by center. 
where the turnover is more than 1.5 crores in a financial year, 50% would be by states, 50% with center. Like what 50% and what 90% or 10% would be governed by state or center, that is yet yet open and the council will have to take a view that how these taxpayers are going to be administered. So, so far as we are concerned as taxpayers, we are worried that whether whether it will be state government or it will be central government or in first year it is a state government and in subsequent it is a central government and again when your turnover comes down, then again there could be a uh, roller coaster ride on this. Coming to automobiles, the rates which have recently been announced by the GST Council in its last meeting on uh, 18th and 19th of May at Srinagar, the rate of GST has been put at 28%. But the CES is also payable and the payment, the, the rate of CES would depend upon the type of vehicle. So this chart explains to you that what is going to be the uh, percentage of CES which will be levied and it varies from 1% to 15%. Like for example, in case of two wheelers with more than 350cc, it is 3%. So 28 plus 3%, it makes it 31. Similarly, on different different cars, uh, different automobiles, the uh, if you take the CES into account, the total total tax, including the GST and the CES, is going to be somewhere in the range of 28% to uh, 43%. Now, this explains to you how the rates are going to be there in the future in GST regime. The rates, rate of taxes which are presently applicable are there and the uh, total total rates uh, are there in this uh, column which talks of 30%, 30.2%, 47%, 49%. And then if we apply GST rate and the CES which is applicable to that particular vehicle, you'll find that in all the cases there is a positive impact. The prices, the taxes post GST are going to fall. And that fall could be from 1.2% to 0.3%. It varies from the type of vehicle. When we go into the GST, registration is very important. Uh, every every SSC is required to be registered. And presently, uh, for the existing SSCs, the provision is that all the all the existing SSCs have to migrate into the uh, GST regime. So rather than having a fresh registration, there's a provision for migration. The migration was there till, th till uh, 30th April, then it got uh, withdrawn and it, is, it has been recommenced from today only, from yesterday only and first to 1st of June to 15th of June, the migration is again open and those SSCs who have not taken the migration earlier, they may use this window of 15 days and take the registration, take the migration so that uh, the transfer of credits also becomes seamless and they're, they're able to migrate smoothly and seamlessly in the GST regime. Those of those of the taxpayers who do not migrate now will have to re-register themselves by way of a fresh registration under the GST regime. And those who are new SSCs or new taxpayers, they will also have to register afresh rather than going on for migration because migration is a window which is applicable only in case of existing SSCs. Now, who should be registered? Every person is required to be registered. And for registration, there is a, th uh, there is a threshold limit of 10 lakh rupees and 20 lakh rupees. 10 lakhs in case of taxpayers who are in the northeastern states and 20 lakhs in case of uh, taxpayers who are in the rest of the India other than the northeastern states and, th and three hazy states. So this threshold limit of 10 lakhs and 20 lakhs will determine whether you should be registered or you should not be registered. If in case the turnover is less than 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs of threshold limit, the Option to register is voluntary. If somebody wants to get registered, he can get the re registration done. But in certain cases, irrespective of the threshold limit, the registration is mandatory, particularly in case where, where you have interstate supplies. So in case in case your turnover is less, but still you have even, even a single transaction which is an interstate supply, you will be required to be registered. Then casual taxable persons are required to be registered. The registration would also be required in case of uh, e-commerce, in case of input service distributors, in case of persons who are required to deduct TDS. Uh, let me tell you at this point of time that TDS and TCS are the two terms which were which are popular in income tax and direct taxes. For the first time in, in the country, the provisions of TDS that is tax reduction at source and tax collection at source that is TCS are being made applicable in case of GST also. Then another relevant point is that for registration, if you have different business verticals, then you can also opt for different registrations. Like the company is one, but you have different verticals of business, uh, which and by, by different verticals I mean that the risk and rewards of those business verticals are altogether different, and 
if if you consider those business verticals uh, as different sets of businesses you can also have registration within the same company with the with that uh, business vertical uh, kept being kept in mind for example in case of automobile dealers there is a showroom there is a workshop somebody may be having a petrol pump or a filling station also so in those in all these three cases either you have one single registration for the entire company as a whole in the state or you can also opt for a registration uh, based on the business verticals so business vertical is basically a, a distribution component of an enterprise which is engaged in supplying uh, uh, goods and services or a group of goods and services which is subject to risk and returns that are different from each other so this is how you have to work out a business vertical then there's a composition scheme composition scheme is basically a simplified uh, a scheme which has been provided under the gst law which provides that in case somebody has a turnover of up to 50 lakh of rupees in a, in a, in a financial year then that ssc or that uh, supplier of goods or services can opt for a can opt for a uh, composition scheme under which the compliance will be uh, minimal and the rate of tax will also be uh, a composite rate of tax and if that is done then uh, he he gets rid, rid from the uh, rigors of complying with various uh, provisions of the gst law like um, filing multiple returns the uh, the provisions relating to tax issuing of tax invoices the provisions relating to uh, input tax credit all those all those are uh, not applicable in those cases and it is a very simple compliance so far as composition rate is concerned like in case of a manufacturer the the rate of uh, tax would be 1% of the turnover in case of restaurant services it could be it would be 2.5% of turnover in case of other supplies or like in case of uh, uh, dealers and traders it could be 4.5% of the turnover this is under the cgst act similar provision is there in the sgst act so effective uh, composition rate of tax would be 2% 5% and 1% Uh, this is basically applicable in case of dealers of goods, but in case of services, only restaurant services have been covered because um, the restaurant services is one service which is uh, basically in uh, an urban sector, and uh, there are small restaurants also in the country. Um, this uh, composition scheme is optional, as I told you. It is not automatic. You have to look at your turnover uh, from all your supplies and from all your offices. Uh, under the same pan which is the which is a pan which is generated by under the income tax law uh, the composition scheme operator will not issue a tax invoice but he will have to issue a bill of supply he will not charge you tax so if he doesn't charge you tax in that case input tax credit will not be available to to the recipient on this as i told you the major major benefit is in relation to the simpler simpler compliances Uh, the lesser number of returns the lesser details of records to be maintained the tax liability is also reduced and there's a lot of ease of doing business so far as the composition suppliers are concerned but the person who deals with the uh, composition supplier uh, he may not be in a advantageous position because if the tax is not charged the input credit will not be available input credit would not be available uh, to that recipient number one and number two uh, so far as competition is concerned he would be in a little bit disadvantageous position because uh, if he, if its cost goes up because he doesn't he is not able to charge you uh, not able to take input tax credit on that and then uh, since tax is not collected you are not able to take the set of benefit also so that way it may become uh, a little bit uh, uh, discouraging so far as uh, recipients are concerned now another important point uh, which uh, i would like to cover is uh, tax invoice GST is going to be one tax law which will bring in 100% transparency so far as the transactions are concerned. There won't there won't be any transaction or any single transaction which is done without issuance of a document, and that document is going to be invoice. It could be it there could be a different forms of invoices uh, so far as businesses are concerned. The main invoice for which under which you are uh, raising uh, you are supplying the goods or services will be called tax invoice and that is that tax invoice would be would be subject to the charge of uh, gst and it will also become the basic document for the input tax credit where you are not charging the uh, gst it will be bill of supply and it will be issued under the composition scheme only then there are certain cases where you know you receive the advance today what happens is advances is, is subject to service tax in case of services but in where you receive the advance for goods it is not subject to tax 
in the GST that will also cover that will, that would also come under the scope of service under the scope of GST. So in that case, if for the person who receives the advance and he has to pay GST on that, he will have to issue a receipt voucher. Similarly, we, there will be a payment voucher when the payment is required to be made under the reverse charge. Uh, all of us are aware that in the in this in the service tax regime that there is a provision for reverse charge and on certain services the recipient of service is required to pay or pay or discharge the tax liability under the reverse charge mechanism. The same provision is being carried forward to GST regime and the difference is that it would cover both goods and services. So in, in case of supply of goods also they would be subject to certain situations where GST would be payable by the recipient of uh, recipient of the supplies under the reverse charge mechanism. Now, the major one of the major impact provision, uh, so far as uh, GST is concerned, is dealing with unregistered persons. This is provision uh, called Section 94, uh, which says that recipient of supply of goods and services should be liable to pay GST under the reverse charge mechanism. If you deal, if you are dealing with a registered supplier, that means your supplier is registered under the GST net. So he will be charging you, he will be issuing you a tax invoice, and whatever amount he charges as GST, that will be available to you for the purposes of input tax credit. Now, in case of dealing with unregistered person, that is, if the person has not got registered, or he's uh, uh, or he or he's uh, he's unregistered because uh, he is covered under the exemption provision because of the threshold limit. Whenever, whenever the recipient of uh, supplies of goods and services deals with unregistered person, the law which has been provided, which has been uh, enacted, says that the sub recipient of the that the recipient of the supplies will have to discharge the tax liability under reverse charge. So, the bottom line is there won't be any transaction under the GST regime where tax has not been paid, except in case of salaries, except in case of interest. Or except in case of certain exempted supplies. So every basically what would happen, your entire debit of the pro, debit side of the profit and loss account would be subject to GST except for salary and interest. So that is that is the underlying underlying uh, impact which is going to happen because the payment will have to be made under the reverse charge mechanism for all the supplies made by the unregistered supplier to the registered supplier. So this is one of the major impacts uh, and uh, it will affect one and all, whether it is a small recipient or it is a bigger recipient. Then there are provisions in relation to the in relation to the supply, in relation to the discharge of uh, tax liabilities so far as time of supply is concerned. So in case of receipt of goods, it would be the date of payment. In case of and the date of payment would be the date after the 60, 60 days from the date of issuance of invoice or payment. Then we come to transitional provisions, which are also equally important in GST. Transitional provisions basically provide for the situations where we are migrating from a existing excise or service tax regime or VAT regime to the GST regime in future. So, what happens to my liabilities? What happens to my credits? What happens to my refunds? What happens to my adjudications when we mig when a taxpayer migrates into the GST regime? So, there are transition provisions which provide for that how such situations would be dealt with. Now, in case of carry forward of unutilized input tax credits are concerned, there are certain stipulations. One of that, uh, one of the conditions is that, that input tax credit should be reflected in my earlier returns. If my returns in the current regime, that is the returns which I, if the, if the GST is going to come in 1st of July, then whatever returns I file up to 30th of June, if that credit is not reflected in the returns, which I have, I have filed or I'll be filing for the period ending till June, then if that reflection is not there, I will not be allowed credit under the GST regime for those credits. So it has to be reflected in the earlier returns. I, that means it also uh, points out that I should have filed my returns. So non-filing of returns would also result into the not into not getting of the credit in the GST regime. Then whatever inputs have been shown as a stock on the appointed day, it should be eligible under the GST taxation regime. So if there are inputs which are not eligible inputs as of now, I cannot take the credit in the GST regime. So point here to be noted is that the credits and the inputs or input services, if they are eligible in the present regime, then only I will be able to carry forward those credits in the GST regime. 
it means that there has to be a credit allowability under the both regime in the present regime and in the GST regime. Then another important condition is unavailable credit of capital goods can be taken and should be eligible under both. See, presently what happens is in case of uh, capital goods, uh, the, I can take the credit if it is covered as an eligible capital good and 50% I have to take in first year and the remaining I can take in the subsequent year. Under the GST regime, it can be done. Whatever is unavailable, that can be carried forward and you can take the credit in the subsequent regime, in the, in the GST regime. Now, good thing about capital goods is that the, the definition of capital goods has become very liberal and I can take the credit 100% in, in the next regime. So supposing if I want to procure some capital good today, I will be able to get 50% credit today and 50% in the GST regime. But if I defer that payment, the defer that procurement to July or under the GST regime, then in that case I would be eligible for 100% credit, uh, credit in one go. In case of composition schemes, the carry forward is not allowed. Now another gray area or the provision where a lot of confusion is going on is in relation to the transition of input tax credit. We have section 140 subsection 3 in the uh, GST law, SGST law, which says that a registered person who was unregistered under the current existing law, that is the C, uh, law, or is engaged in manufacturing exempted goods or providing exempted services or dealing in exempted goods for the purpose of registry or good subject to first point in case of SGST uh, or providing provides working working work works contract services and was availing benefit of notification number 26 of 2012 in case of services or is a first stage or second stage dealer registered importer or a, depot, or, a, or a depot of a manufacturer where this person was entitled to credit of input at the time of sale of goods. Now all these persons may take credit of eligible duties. What are eligible duties? I'll tell you. In the relation to input input held in stock, semi-finished goods and finished goods, the eligible duties would be the duties of excise, duty, uh, excise duties of customs, SAD and CVD, not basic customs duty because basic customs duty is not getting subsumed, only SAD and CVD are getting subsumed, and CCD so, and VAT in case of for the purposes of SGST. So excise duties, uh, additional customs duties and VAT all will be eligible for carry forward. The conditions, but it is subject to conditions. The conditions are that goods must be used for making taxable supplies under GST. Yes. If you are not using these goods for taxable supplies, then of course the ITC is not available. It should be available under the under, under the GST regime also. So if it is an input or input today, it should be also be an input in GST regime. That is one of the important conditions. Then text paying documents are available. Now, what is what is text paying document? Text paying document is defined in the, under rule 9 of the present uh, sandwich credit rules. So any text paying document should be available. If you don't have the text paying documents, then the carry forward of input credit is for the closing stock is not going to be easy. It, it won't be there. And then as we have the condition in the present regime, those inputs should not be more than 12 months old. Even today, in the sandwich credit rules of 2004, if the invoices, tax invoices are old and older than one year, we are not able to take the sandwich credit. Similarly, we are we will in case the document doc, duty pay documents are available, the taxpayers would be eligible to send to input tax credit in the GST regime also, provided two provided. The two main conditions are fulfilled. One, they have in their possession the tax paying document, and those tax paying documents are not for a period of 12 months old. 12 months old. Now, if that is not the case, then you have another provision uh, uh, by way of a provision to section 140, subsection 3, which talks of the situations where you can take the, take the carry forward of the input, input uh, tax credit where the documents are not available. So if the documents are available and they are within a period of 12 months, you are allowed to take 100% credit. But in many cases, in case of dealers, in case of supply of goods, you will find that the tax paying documents are not available because though they may not be first stage or second stage dealers. In such cases, the credit would be limited to the 40% of the CGSD or the SGSD which is paid and same can be taken within six months from the appointed date. The period, the, the language uses six tax periods, so it could be six, and we have to file a return on a monthly basis, so six months, within six months from the appointed date, that is the date on which the GST comes into force, this could be taken. Again, there are conditions that those goods should be, should not be exempt or nil related. Those documents of procurements of goods are available, 
but they may not be tax paying documents but there has to be a documentary proof for the procurement of goods and for this for this for the purpose of claiming 40% uh, uh, input tax credit a prescribed form called gst gctr trank is required to be submitted within uh, six tax periods and credit will be credit input tax credit will be credited in the ledger on the basis of form gst pmt2 on the on the on the common portal now what are these tax paying documents these are the uh, documents called tax invoice bill of entry debit note uh, form and there's two return forms gst trans and form gst pmt2 for claiming credit on notional basis then there could be certain specific issues in relation to uh, automobile sector uh, one is what happens to second and goods or second and vehicles in those cases uh, there is a specific provision which talks of that in case the in case the taxpayer has not taken the input tax credit then he can pay G, he can discharge the gst liability on the on the basis on the amount which is the difference between the purchase price and the sale price and the, if the difference is negative then it has to be ignored only when the difference is positive the gst will have would have to be discharged on that amount then bookings also become taxable so if you book a vehicle today and it is delivered after two months the liability to discharge a gst on that advance would also be there then automobile sector will also have to undergo a major change in their pricing policy in their discounts policy in their marketing strategy because all these discounts and freebies which they generally offer would be subject to the you know uh, very rigid, rigid provisions of uh, the valuation uh, because if the if the discount is given before the issuance of invoice or the supply then it is considered to be excluded from the valuation otherwise it, it on that on those discounts which are given post invoicing uh, on on our, in all those in all those cases the uh, taxpayer will have to pay gst on that discount amount also then there are issues in relation to what happens to demo vehicles or demo cars they will now be considered as capital goods if you transfer the stock uh, from uh, one office to other office or from one showroom to another showroom it will be considered as a supply uh, the free service vouch coupon vouchers what happens to the taxability they will be taxable at the time when they are issued if the if the services are identified if the activity is identified it will be there then there could be certain expenses which are in nature of reimbursement or like insurance registration uh, road taxes etc so if they are incurred as a pure agent that means the dealers don't charge anything over and above those amounts it would be covered as a pure agent expenses incurred as pure agent and tax liability may not happen but for all these purposes you will have to have proper documentation then another important point here in case of automobile dealers is that there's a difference between advance and deposits deposits are not considered to be part of the valuation but in case it is advance then it, that advance would have to be considered for the purposes of uh, valuation and uh, there will have to be the gst liability discharge on that uh, use of second hand cars and second hand goods i have discussed the tax liability would be on the basis of the difference in case the input tax credit has not been taken in case the itc has been taken then it will uh, be taxed at the, at, a, at the as per the normal procedure so these are friends uh, uh, some of the points i wanted to discuss with you on the taxation of uh, uh, in case of auto automobile uh, sector uh, i would welcome the questions uh, of the attendees on this thank you very much Thanks a lot, Sanjeev. In fact, uh, as you went on the slides, there were a lot of, um, you know, very uh, <clears throat> active participation. People already started posting a lot of questions. Uh, and I can see at least from the Consumer Affairs Committee of ACMA, a lot of members already putting in. Uh, as you rightly said, I think let's take a few of the uh, general questions. Uh, yeah. If you go to slide number 29, let's, I think, let's finish the, the presentation part first. So on slide number 29, hmm. where you say that if there is if there is a um, if there is a document, then they are able to take the input credit on the transition part or transition part, and these unregistered uh, uh, you know uh, dealers they are unregistered in excise right not in the VAT. Hmm. Yeah. Today they are not paying excise like a distributor of an automobile they don't pay excise but they are uh, they are having a VAT registration number and they will get all the credit. But this means that anything which is 12 months before purchase he will not be able to take input credit no in any case no even today you can't take invoice has to be whatever credit you are taking that has to be for a period of, that has to be within a period of one year even today okay, i cannot so, take the credit okay if some of the automobile dealers have stock which is slow moving which is two years More sometime, than one year or one and a half year, year. Mm -hmm. 
they will have difficulty. Okay. Second thing, there's a uh, the if you look at slide number 30, then just after that slide, yeah. which talks regarding 40%, uh, what happens? Whatever stock is left to those uh, distributors who are not having this kind of document where excise is reflecting, they are able to only take 40%. 40%. In that yeah. case, whatever is the extra tax, are they allowed to charge from the customers over and ever no. MRP? No, they are not allowed to charge from the customers. They will have to give this transfer this benefit to the customers only. Then only they will be allowed to. So only 40 percent. Yeah, but so this benefit is only 40 percent which they have to transfer to the customer. Now that 60 yes, percent so loss of excise that, in that some cases. Cost, uh, that would be cost, cost to the. Yes. That dealer. But if that cost is making the calculation is that difficult that he has to sell at over MRP, how that will play? No, in in case he is see. Uh, if you are talking of selling on on a price which is over MRP, in that case, you know there's a there's a uh, provision, specific provision on anti-profiteering. So that would that would come into play, and uh, I don't think dealers or manufacturers should uh, be taking that liberty to sell at a higher price uh, without transferring the benefit of input okay. effect. Which is so I'll just rephrase. Uh, the concern is not about making profit. Concern is to curtail the losses. So if we buy something after first of July. He will buy at 28% uh, tax rate, which is GST. Yeah, now, yeah, when yeah. He, and he sell at 28%. Whatever he had stock before 1st of July, around 7% or something excise is basically his cost. Okay. Which means his actual tax payout will be 28 plus 7, even if he give that 40%, you know, uh, relief to the customer. And if this cost he charge in a normal price, that means his price selling price for the old stock will be higher without yeah. making any profit. And in that case, sometime it can even cross MRP. What happens then? Oh, in that in that case, so see, he's only reducing his profit. In that case, he's only reducing, he's re only reducing his losses. So yes, he's reducing that is his losses. Losses. Yes. So with this so far as GST is always concerned, uh, it doesn't bar you for, debar you from doing this type of transaction. But, uh, okay. and since the stock is also, also of an earlier period, so I don't think anti-profiteering law is a provision is of section 171 is also going to come into play for so far as this particular transaction is concerned. Yeah, and whatever, it, whatever. But, but the other yeah. matter is that even if it tries to do that, the market will not because market is very competitive. Yeah, somebody what, will not buy the stock. No, no. Why? Why one should buy at a higher price? That is the point. Exactly. Uh, and one way, of, one way of looking, one way of looking at it is, you know, uh, there could be there could be some scheme uh, from the manufacturing sector. To these dealers, that how do how do they dispose of this asset, uh, these type of stocks which are slow moving? So maybe that uh, something will work out of this. Which yeah, sir, I think it is it is today because we are talking about operational now. It is not tomorrow. What is happening now is most of these uh, dealers have stopped buying. They are just telling to the uh, aftermarket component manufacturers, will not buy because whatever we buy is basically making me liable for these losses, and we don't see any answer. Yeah, and it's not happening in this sector, it's happening in other uh, FMCG sectors also, it's happening, pharma sectors also, it's happening. So wherever inputs are there, wherever stocks are there, this is a general issue. And 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 uh, I understand that the DST Council, which is meeting tomorrow uh, on in the 15th meeting, this is one of the burning issues which is being, which will be discussed at, at length. Because many, there are many yeah, trade yeah. bodies who are... Yeah, in fact, we are expecting some outcome from there, otherwise yeah. it is actually a big point for all of us. Now, second topic is uh, very basic, that whenever we are charging now GST, it is based on a transaction or uh, you know, the value, the transactional value. What is this value? How it is calculated? Is based on the, the, the seller and the buyer, or there can be some other uh, guideline? No, there is a specific provision in section 15, which talks of, uh, talks of valuation. And uh, in GST, that valuation has to be uh, open market valuation. And open market valuation is the transaction value. It is not neither the MRP. It is the open. It is the transaction value, and that transaction value will play only in two situations: when the sole consideration is money, it is in money, monetary form, and two, both the parties are not related. So, if that being the case, the transaction value will apply. If the transaction value is not applicable because of any reason, or maybe that the, the consideration is partly in money, partly in kind, or the parties are related. In that case, there will be there will be valuation provisions which talk of the comparison method, which talks of the actual cost plus profit method. So there are two, three, four methods which they've identified. So one has to follow the uh, 
that and the, you can't jump that order. That order will have to be followed. So if if it is not a transaction value, then you go to the transaction, uh, you go to the valuation rules, and on the basis of valuation rules, the valuation of that uh, transaction will have to be done. So in the open market, it is not a problem if you can sell at loss, you can sell at cheaper price. Even if your computer is selling at a higher price, valuation is decided by what your company yes, is selling to. Yes, yes. The only thing is, both the part supplier and the recipient has to be unrelated. Number one. Unrelated. And and it has to be a, so this whole consideration has to be in money form. And the valuation rules also say that discounts are are not part of the uh, valuation if those discounts are known when the invoice is issued. So before the issuance of invoice or at the time when you are issuing the invoice, whatever discounts may be based on the competition, may be based on the uh, uh, quality or timing of the supply, uh, those discounts would not be added to the valuation to, to the valuation on which you are you have to pay discharge the GST liability if they are documented in the invoice itself. If you issue an invoice and later on give a discount, then there is a problem that that type of valuation will be added. Okay, so when you issue a credit note, let's take after after the uh, one month or two month you issue your credit note, then this tax is gone. You are not able to take credit of that tax. No, if you have given a discount, how do you, how do you take the credit? You will have to reverse that credit. You will have to, and then okay, in, suppose, in those cases, yeah, yeah, please. If you give if you give all the discount on invoice is fine, then it is uh, the valuation will be that much lower. But in some cases, uh, the, the distributor are offered from company something called turnover discount. Sometimes it is some schemes incentive which actually bonus, happens. Incentive bonus again. Yes. In those cases also, it will be, it will be uh, not added to the evaluation. The only condition is that the basis for, on which you are giving the discount, after, say, for the trade uh, discounts, quantity discount, which are decided on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis or annual basis. So in all such cases, there's an agreement between the manufacturer and the distributor or a dealer. So the trigger point for that discount is basically at the end of that event. And that event is, say, on a basis of on quarter or uh, six months or one year or whatever. So and that is there in the document. So whatever whatever discounts or credits or incentives or bonuses you are giving, you are getting, you are getting because of that agreement. Again, it is a document. So whatever has been documented and and invoiced, invoiced later on, or a supplementary invoice is issued, debit or credit order issued, those will also not form form part of the valuation. And whatever tax charge on on those invoices, you will get the credit subsequently in subsequent period when the when you receive when you issue a credit note to that. So Only thing is, the discount is given. Okay, when we file the return later, we can take that. Uh, the, yes, the, it, will, it, will be, it will be given to you. The two conditions are there. It should be documented and it should have reference to the invoice against which that discount has been given to you. Okay. So, and in many cases, there won't, be any, there won't be any problem. Okay, because most of these credit notes are conditional. So if the distributor or the dealer is able to achieve a target, then he will get. So document will be there, yes. but the amount will not be known. It will be known at the only at the later stage uh, when the later. figure is arrived. Yes. The, see, Another it is in GST. Documentation is very important. If you are documenting whatever you are doing, there are no no issues. But if you don't document, then uh, the trouble starts. Very good. And these documents have to be filed somewhere before, or it will be just in the in the hand of. No, it, 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 they should be in your records. That's all. Okay. Uh, one other practical issue, what uh, yeah. what our people are facing in B2C business is they are issuing a lot of coupons which goes to mechanics and retailers, and these coupons are basically uh, afterwards. You don't know how many coupons will be encashed, and these coupons are like a marketing expenses. How this will be dealt and where the money should be paid? No, in this case, the liability liability uh, the the property. Point time of supply and the place of supply for vouchers is very important. Like it happens in case of free warranties also. So in all these cases, what will happen? They say when the if the voucher is able to determine the uh, place of supply and the time of supply, in those cases it is when they are issued. So normally, when if if the service is identifiable, if the activity is identifiable, when they are issued, that was the point at which taxability will be there. But where you are not able to do so, then at the time of redemption, when the redemption takes place, supposing I get I buy a vehicle, and I have given a coupon, I have given I am given three coupons of service, free service, but I don't go to the service station to get them uh, redeemed. So in that case, there will be an issue because uh, as of now, the, the the law says that when they are issued, they will be taxed, rather than when they are redeemed, they should be taxed. So there will be an there's an anomaly on this, uh, and this becomes this is a gray area. 
So as long as it is root, we are able to uh, bring the valuation down with that. Yes. Whether it is encast or not encast. Yes. Okay, very nice. So uh, I guess uh, Mr. Fajal Martin from your side on these stocks, you got the answer. Uh, yes, there is a loss on this seven, uh, roughly seven percent for all the dealers. But uh, as moving forward, if the tomorrow's meeting of GST Council says this 40% can move up, there is a hope. So uh, Mr. Sanjeev said it is not a problem of only automotive guys, it's a problem of everybody, more or less. There is another people question are, which... People are, uh, people are expecting on. that this 40% may go to 60% or even 100%. So there are a yes. lot of hopes uh, by various sectors. We also hope so because it has really made our life very, very miserable. Uh, coming to Mr. Amir Hussain, uh, who is talking about uh, the pre-owned cars. I think you might have got some answer while it was being uh, so there. Uh, but for the pre-owned cars, uh, there is a marketplace model. And in marketplace model, today they don't pay tax because it is the invoicing is done between buyer and seller. How that will yeah. play in future? Yeah. Uh, so far as pre-owned uh, vehicles are concerned, you know, there is a specific provision. There is a specific provision in the uh, uh, GST law, uh, which says that, uh, you know, where the, uh, I'll read out that provision for you, where a taxable supply is provided by a person dealing in buying and selling of second and goods, that is used goods as, as such, or after such minor processing, which does not change the nature of the goods. Like if you buy a pre-owned uh, car, you are selling a pre-owned car. And where no input tax credit has been availed on purchase of such goods. This is very important. When you are buying a pre-owned car for the purposes of selling it as a pre-owned car, and you are not you have not availed any input tax credit on that purchase. That input tax credit purchase would happen only when only when you are buying from a registered person. So in case in case you have in, you are not taking that uh, input tax credit, in that case, the value of supply will be the difference between selling price and purchase price. And where that price, the difference is negative, it will be ignored. So when what say like in case of capital gains, what do we do? The same thing will apply here. The only only gray area is what happens to my cost of improvement or cost of minor uh, processing. That they have not said. They say difference between purchase price and selling price. Supposing okay. I, I buy I, I buy a pre-owned vehicle for say one lakh of rupees, I spend another thirty thousand rupees on that, and I sell it for one point seven five lakhs. So my my purchase price is one or one point thirty. So this is a big question mark because whenever you are buying a pre-owned pre vehicle, in any case, you are also spending some money on the improvement or uh, uh, renovation of that vehicle, repairs of that vehicle. Yes. Uh, let's say there are two business models on pre-owned cars. One is, of course, you buy and sell. And another business model, not only in pre-owned cars, but also for spares in the market, is called e-commerce portals, where what they do is they just a marketplace. So is there a special provision for these e-commerce companies that they are liable to pay taxes because today what is happening is they are just marketplace. A, a seller comes on their website and a buyer comes and buys it and invoice is raised by the seller. So in the marketplace invoice is not raised by you know people like Amazon or people like Flipkart. What will happen in future uh, in GST remain the same or any change? No, in case of e-commerce transactions, you know, there are separate provisions and for e-commerce transactions, the uh, uh, the tax liability will be there, uh, and uh, the tax liability will. So far as uh, taxation is concerned, there is not going to be any change. But that e-commerce operator will have to discharge the liability of TCS also. That is tax collection and source. So whosoever is buying and whosoever is selling on uh, on the e-commerce portal, that would be subject to another provision of TCS, and the e-commerce operator will have to deduct a uh, tax collection at source from the uh, uh, proceeds which are going to the uh, uh, seller. That okay. is the addi additional feature. Okay, let's talk, uh, go back again about the stocks and the returns. Uh, suppose if a dealer or today has a X stock and he has a lot of return end of this month because a lot of retailer would like to return the product, they don't want to keep the stocks. And he has and he has a very valid document of excise. So the excise is written on his document when he buys and he gets suddenly a huge flow of uh, goods return on last day of this month. Uh, will that be considered for the stocks valuation or not? It should be because it is in the normal course of business. It should be that there is why why it should not be considered. So not a issue. Uh, in yeah. past, in excise calculation for the uh, B two C aftermarket, there was something called abatement in excise calculation based on MRP. That abatement is now going over because the valuation will be yeah. based on the transactional price. 
which yeah, means we don't have that, yeah, sense, yeah. yeah which means mrp is free to be kept doesn't matter yeah. there are no abatements in gst there is one question again coming from Mr. Naveen and he is asking about how to handle the rejection of parts and he is talking basically in the manufacturing uh, domain where the vendors when they supply the uh, component and in our factory we say okay this is rejected. In past we used to get a credit note. Will that be fine or there will be an additional tax implication? No, it, uh, see what happens with the sales returns. What, uh, say what hap whatever happens to sales returns, same will apply to rejections also. So and there's a there's a provision for debit notes and credit notes. So that will play. So I don't think there should be any issue. The only thing is the timing may be different. So whenever whenever a credit note is issued or a debit note is issued, you in the subsequent, in subsequent month when you file the return, you can take the uh, uh, benefit of that adjustment. I don't think that should okay. be issue. Normal normal business practices would continue. Okay, very nice. What will happen to the CVD? Um, uh, C CVD in past we had for various different stuff. The CVD was imposed, and now CVD is now you know assumed in the GST. So if the CVD was pretty high, that means those goods will become cheaper. Yeah, and in case of CVD, uh, we, instead of CVD now it will be IGST. So it will be considered okay. as an interstate transaction, and IGST would be applicable on that. And IGST okay. would also be subject to subject to input tax credit. Okay. One Mr. Srikant asks, uh, if he is asking if the purchase is done from excise free zone and only CST of whatever sometime to 1.5% is paid, then ITC can be availed is only to that extent of CST? Yes. Okay. Yes. And in the, other, in the other case where we were talking about ITC, we said both excise and CST can be claimed. Yeah, for claiming CST, for, for claiming CST, there is a specific provision. Uh, there is a specific provision in the uh, in the transitional provisions. We have uh, section 140, which talks of how do you take the credit uh, in case of CST. So, in case of CST, yes. what will what will happen is uh, you know uh, there is section 12 in uh, CST that has to be complied with. If that is complied with substantially, then you can take the credit. Otherwise, it, uh, that credit cannot be taken. Very good. So, Srikant, all your questions more or less is answered regarding the abatement on MRP, regarding the uh, uh, treatment of credit note debit. Credit note, there is no big change, but what Mr. Sanjeev said, as long as you are able to document it, uh, that has the transaction value. Okay, one Mr. Sumit Patel, he is asking, I am an exporter, how can I claim rebate of tax charge on invoice after export? I think it's pretty easy. Yes, sir. See, all exports are going to be zero rated. And there will be a procedure which will uh, determine how you have, the, 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 it will pro, uh, provide you the manner in which you have to claim the refund. So, whatever, whatever taxes you pay uh, for a supply which is being exported, it is going to be zero rated 100%. And the government has also said that 90% of your refund claim will be allowed to you within a period of seven days. And the, the remaining 10% will be released only after due scrutiny, after the uh, scrutiny or audit is done by the department. So I don't think there's, there would be a uh, issue in this because they were pretty clear on this that it is going to be zero rated. Uh, so Srikant, more or less everything for you. Sumitji, uh, for you also it's answered. But uh, as you are asking again about coupons, Srikant, uh, for coupon we just heard. In fact, it will be better for us now because these coupons at the time of issue, if you are documenting it, it will go to uh, reduce your valuation and hence the tax implications. Uh, coming to Mr. Tapos Gupta, you are talking, what is the effect of closing stock? I think this we answered uh, just before sometime. Mr. Ankit Dehar, uh, what about the stock which is left and slow moving? I think slow moving you answered, if it is more than one year, it will be a loss, uh, the tax input will not come for the dead stock and slow moving. Uh, the stock is imported based on existing tax and duty structure is not a problem because all those documents you will have while importing including CVD and this will be then inputted. As long as the document is available, uh, Ankit, this will be possible. Uh, Sandeep Sarma, you are asking for again same about the stocks which we just discussed. Uh, manufacturer or dealer. So if you look at manufacturers are already excise registered. So for them it is even easier. We only talked about those people who are not registered. Even they can take the input credit based on those documents. So that's also a benefit uh, to them. Uh, Prashant Tripathi, what if any person below threshold limit pays tax under reverse charge? So I don't think the payment, I'm able to... No, basically yes, payment under reverse charge, you will have to be registered. 
So if you are discharging the tax liability and the reverse side mechanism, you have to be registered. So there's no question of not getting registered. And if you are registered and making the payment and the reverse and the reverse side, you can take the credit. Even today you can take the yes. credit. So that is not a big issue. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so Najir Hussain, he is uh, asking, what if we are not registered under excise, but we have bill of that with excise, so can we claim the credit of excise? And you just heard, yes, you can claim it, even yes, if you have been not Yes, you can, you can have 100% credit for that, because you are registered. Sakshi Chitra, what will be the impact on buying and selling of used vehicles? You already saw that uh, Mr. Sanjeev already answered you. What will be the tax charge on, on that service? It's basically that difference. Uh, what will be the GST impact on the intermediaries in the used vehicle segment? It's all if you are really buying and selling, it will be applying the same. If you are not raising the invoice, it will not apply to you. Yeah, is I, 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 sir, I, one point I would like to separate in case of pre-owned vehicles. See, today what happens is, you know, the rate of tax for the new vehicle is different. And the rate on the pre-owned vehicle, rate of tax on the pre-owned vehicle is also different. In many cases it is not taxed. And in many states, it is a composition composite rate of one percent or two percent. Now, another gray area which I would like to bring to the notice of everyone here is that in case of a pre-owned pre -owned, uh, car sale, the rate of tax has not been clarified. So, what would happen? It will be twenty-eight percent only. So whether you buy a new car or you buy a pre-owned car, it is twenty-eight percent. But then the question is, what happens to the cess? Because along with the twenty-eight percent, cess is also applicable even to small cars. So if I'm buying a car on which the three percent or fifteen percent sales is applicable, whether I should be able, I should be uh, required to pay a sales on, sec on the pre-owned uh, car supply also. So this is one thing where there is no clarity. Yes, I also feel so. Uh, Asis, uh, he's asking uh, regarding not only basic excise duty, but can dealers take the credit of basic excise duty as well as NCCD, infra sales, and automobile sales levied on yes, cars for yes. billing for the stock plan? All of this, yes. but but the cesses which are not there in the GST regime for that you can't. It is a loss to you because the the, the basic rule is that it should be there in both the both the both the tax regimes, and all these cesses are going along with the along with the excise duty. When when we come to the GST regime, there will be only one cess that is compensation cess. So we can't. So we won't be able to take. We won't be able to take okay. credit of it. The infra cess and automobile cess, he will not be able to. Even education says, Swachh Bharat says, Krishi Kalyan says, none of these says. Okay, okay. Uh, coming to one um, uh, one thing in my mind, going uh, for salaries and interest, on everything there will be GST, in in a in a very layman word. Which means, yes. from the cash flow point of view, it will really be a very different ball game. Can you just dwell on that? Yes. The point is, see, in GST, the working working capital and cash management. These are the two important things which will have to be handled very, uh, very, very, uh, very much uh, caution. Uh, because you know what is going to happen uh, in GST regime, it is not only tax compliance but also tax management. When I talk of tax management, it becomes a board issue now. Because your cash, cash management, inventory management, working capital management, everything will be dependent upon the GST. So it's not like you, you, there's a tax liability, just pay the tax. It is going to impact you. you. You have to pay taxes on advances. In case of continuous supply of goods and services, at every stage you have to pay the taxes and you can't take the credit unless the entire supply is complete. So there would be, and what happens to rejections and returns? You get the credit afterwards. Supposing your, your supplier, uh, or your vendor is not not matching the transactions. He's not reconciling. Again, you are in trouble. It adds to your working capital. So, working capital management is very important, uh, and it is more important than rather the uh, more important than the tax compliance itself. So, tax compliance, along with all these things, if they are managed properly, I think uh, it will be in management's interest that it is not only to to treat GST as not only a compliance but much more than compliance because it is it will become a management function and today what happens is uh, any chartered accountant or any tax department in an organization would comply with the law with the tax law tomorrow what is going to happen the tax department or the compliance is, will be a multifunctional approach wherein you have to have your marketing fellow you have to have your procurement fellow you have to have your distribution fellow your stores manager and and your cfo although all all of them put together will decide how they have to manage the GST compliances. 
because your rating is also important you have to look at anti profit rating also like that because as you said uh, the timing of the tax you know it depends also about no management decision and this gives you a cash flow uh, management which you call tax management and even if let's say of your working capital if half or 30% of it now has a more number of months or your whole turnover ratio out of your uh, uh, quick ratio becomes uh, uh, lower you will have a issue in terms of the actual cost so the tax is one part but the interest cost will increase or the cost of capital will increase definitely it is going to go up one thing which comes to uh, us in the automobile sector is we have a lot of retailers who have been written unorganized and they have uh, they are not registered also and when they get invoices those invoices does not have the tax or excise uh, clearly written on that they may be vat registered so they can take your vat credit depending on what how they are filing return as you condition you rightly put can they safeguard themselves in something what you said that composition scheme roughly 50 lakhs if his turnover he can manage uh, these mom and pop shops they are all small guys uh, do you think it is better for them to get into composition scheme and just pay this one person and get out of it or like you said the input credit they will not get because they are selling to end consumer now end consumer whatever it is they don't need any input because they are consuming it Yes. So when they're selling to them, the retailers are the best qualified for this composition scheme. Do you feel so? Yes, yeah, I agree with you, and that is why we have the composition scheme for all these mom and pop shows. Uh, you know, wherever you have B two C transaction, uh, it would be advisable in there. It is in their interest only to go go in for uh, the composition scheme because nobody is going to take credit out of it because it ultimately goes to the consumer. Exactly. Coming to what you just spoke about entry profit ring, uh, there are some companies, and in fact, if you see last four or five months, there has been the raw material, the mostly metal and plastics have a upward pressure on pricing. So our costs have increased, but some of us are scared that when our cost even increases and we have to have our prices increased, it should not be seen as entry profit ring that just because of GST. Uh, we increase our prices so what is that uh, caution we should play should we not touch our prices at all for the next 2 3 months but when the compulsion is there that the raw material prices are increased we should increase the price see anti profit ring provision has been brought only in relation to gst now the government what government wants is that you know learning from the experience in other countries wherever gst has come in most of those cases the inflation has gone up uh, particularly in the initial period Now, oh, what what our government wants is that uh, with GST coming in, there should not be an inflation. So, how I price my product is something different. The government should not be interfering in how do I do business, or they should not be teaching me how should I how should a businessman do the business. But the point is that in case of GST, in case of GST, what will happen? They are saying two things only. So, if you are getting an input credit today, which you are which you are not getting in the earlier regime. or because of the gst coming in your your cost of cost goes is re, is reduced at least you pass on the benefit which is accruing to you because of the on these two accounts that you should transfer supposing my salary cost goes up my interest cost goes up my rent rent goes up so in all those cases you know i i i can't be made to sell at a loss or supply supply the goods or services at a loss so barring those things they are saying that only you should be able to satisfy the government or the officers that this is the benefit i have which came to me the like 6% 7% and this is affected in in my cost take in any case you cannot you can't you can't be out of pocket when you supply the goods and services in the end as so a practitioner yeah as a you know operation do you foresee that we may have to go for another audit to prove that we are not anti profiteering it will be almost like another tax audit or how how will we handle this cost costing becomes important sir in this case what will happen to protect yourself from the uh, likely you know harassment from the tax officials what the companies what the businesses should do they should have a provision for a proper costing in the in the books of in, the, in their books they should keep proper record of the costing and if required they can go for a co auto or a voluntary cost audit by a cost auditor otherwise there there are chances that the government may also impose cost audit and on a case to case basis okay because if you have cost audit done or if you have cash for at least the big company and manufacturers will do that with that document you will be able to defend it yeah but voluntarily we will not be able to make our own small just like transfer price audit or something this is not needed only when some eventuality comes we we need to do it yeah uh 
coming to this uh, uh, in specifically within automobile we have a tractor or agro category where uh, the taxes in past has been quite you know different than the normal automobile and we used to see that a lot of traders used to sell products they used to buy from us at a higher tax rate and they used to uh, ride tractor parts and they used to sell because of that the tax evasion used to happen now in 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 the current regime i think tractor at such is at i think 12% and the yeah. spares at 28% 28% uh, how will this then at a dealership level will play uh, dealers will have to abide by what is there in the law. Uh, I don't think there would be any tax evasion on this account because everything has to be documented and invoiced. See, if you don't, if you say that no, don't issue an invoice, then the uh, the system of the government will say that you are you are piling up these stocks. So if you're if you're buying buying with the invoice, you have to sell with the invoice. So in, in okay. tracking of inventory, tracking of inventory is the you know uh, very easier now. It will be very easy by the for the government to track the inventory. If you buy without an invoice and sell with an invoice, you are in trouble. If you buy with an invoice and sell without an invoice, you are in trouble. So document uh, okay, holds but, Yeah, but when somebody is out of the tax net, and I think this is what uh, rampant in our, especially coming from the ACMA point of view, we have roughly 30% of our trade in aftermarket, which is uh, kind of unaccounted. They are like un, uh, they are not uh, legitimate always. They don't pay taxes. They are not in the tax net. They are not in the excise net. And now they will still survive somehow. This is quite a big, large 50,000 crore and 30% of that. What do you think that still there are loopholes by which they can, you know, we have a lot of uh, CAs around, you know, not everybody is. So th do you see that it is, is now very, very difficult just for the uh, confidence of our trade? It will, be, it will be very difficult, sir. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing a transaction without an invoice will be things of past now. I don't think it will be possible in the GST regime. Even if even if it is exempt, you are buying from a you are buying from a registered person. So he will give you the invoice. But when you are selling, even if you don't give the invoice, your closing stock will tell you what what you have sold, what you have not sold. So transparency is one thing which will be uh, you know there in the GST regime, and the evasion would be virtually zero, or it will be very 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 difficult. Let's say same thing, thing is going to happen in terms of yeah. yeah, it is fine. Voluntarily, it is difficult. But if, when it comes to enforcement, we have, let's say, 300,000 of these retail shops. Now, what they have stock at the end of the day physically and what is in the books, they always call this ek number ka, do number ka. Uh, this will not change. They will still have, uh, if something is outside their whole system, who will audit them? There are around 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 of them. Sir, there will be, see, this this type of uh, enforcement will happen now. There will be very strict uh, and very uh, rigid enforce info, enforcement, very strict very strict enforcement. Uh, you know, uh, your vehicles will get confiscated, the goods will get confiscated, and you know, uh, if you're if you're buying raw material, see, I, either the entire chain right from the procurement to the raw material till the production of the finished good and its distribution sale, everything goes out of the system. Then only you can say that you know, we look at a situation where everything is numbered off. Otherwise, it won't happen. Even 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 if you are able to produce, even, you, even if you are able to procure the raw material without, uh, without any invoice, and you are able to pr uh, produce also, you are able to sell also. Where do you transport? The transport vehicles are, will, they are e-way e bills now. So no transport vehicle will be allowed to, to allowed to go uh, come on the road without a e bill. So all those things will happen. So let's see how how enforcement will be done and uh, how things uh, fare when the GST comes in. But it it's going to be very very difficult, and we we may, the businessmen will have to change their habits of number one, number two, and whatever. So we hope for best actually. We hope for best yeah, that. Yes, uh, and, and, and if that happens, I think I think in the larger interest, yes, if something can be, if this can happen. After demonetization, this will become uh, the another important step, maybe for the cleaning of the system as an economy as a whole, and eventually all of us uh, benefit out of it. Okay. So. We from okay, we from automobile now. Let's shift from passenger car to commercial vehicle segment. In commercial vehicle segment, basically our one of the major contributors is the transport sector. Other than you know mining projects and construction, uh, they are in transportation sector. If what we hear from GST now and read in GST is all these nakas will go off, all these tolls will go off, and they will not be disturbed, uh, at least for a year or so. In what condition you think that they will come back again? What is the understanding? 
I see if everything is successful in GST regime, I don't think that will come back. Uh, but you should also not forget that apart from this, there are going to be mobile units. So there will be mobile enforcement. So it's not that NACA, that NACA is at every kilometer. So you can be you can be you can be trapped and caught anywhere. And then goods can be confiscated. The vehicle can be confiscated if it is without a proper e-way bill. And I have told. Uh, they said that these mobile vans will be like dormant for some time. Could be for some time, but uh, eventually something will uh, will have to come out now because this e-way bill is going to change the way the goods are transported, distributed, and uh, see whatever the point is. Even if I am producing, and that entire production is unaccounted for. To reach the market, I have to be on the roads. So eBay will will will, will take care of uh, that type of evasion. And this okay, eBay is going to be a much uh, much bigger issue for all the business community. Yeah, fully agreed. Uh, as as you rightly said again in the in the beginning, for us it is uh, tax management as, as well as tax compliance. Now management needs a lot of tools and techniques, especially from the IT side. So I'm very sure those who are a little bit uh, size-wise mediocre or maybe a little bit bigger, they will manage it. Let's look at all the retailers. And from my own personal experience also, we tried a level best to bring at least these retailers even on a mobile phone. Forget about computer and using and filing all of this. And a large section of them are not able to put an IT system about their inventory and stock system. And we foresee that some of the tier three suppliers from the supplier side and then from the forward chain, all the retailers will be a little incompetent in adopting to that. And the first few months can be a pure for manufacturer like us or marketers like any other aftermarket company. What does it mean when it is not reconciling? And for a long time, it is not reconciling. What all we can do? Uh, so the point here is, you know, of course, in GST, everything is going to be automated. So it has to be on electronic platform without fail. How do we, as a taxpayer, gear up? The bigger companies, the people who are in the online sector, they will do. They will buy the software. There will be hundreds of softwares available in the market, right from 5,000 rupees to whatever amount. Now, what happens is, you know, for the smaller people who are not able to computerize their accounts or who are not able to operate on the computer, there's another major, major, major challenge that we don't have power throughout the day in, the, in various parts of the country. What happens to uh, you? Know, and business, uh, connectivity. Yeah, both, these, both these issues would be there. So what they are saying is that government, this GST is avoiding Suvida providers. They've already already cleared 34 GST Suvida providers as an intermediary, which will add as a which will act as a link or a bridge between the government and the uh, taxpayer. In the second batch, another 160 Suvida providers have been uh, uh, shortlisted. Now these Suvida providers will provide the Interface between the GST network and GST network and uh, the taxpayer, and they will be responsible for the compliances. Of course, it will be for some cost, but the cost will also be regulated by the GST, and they are saying it will be very minimal. And uh, by that, I think things would uh, happen and reconciliations would take place. So we are now very close to the end time. Uh, uh, of course, Dr. Sanjeev, the way you put it so simple, I think the whole discussion was in a more or less as if we are now uh, going to execute and all of us have to execute this in a very very short time and uh, you had answers for almost everything and especially your last answer which is more about how do we tackle it from the execution point of view to support them i guess the government is well prepared because as you said these suvida centers and suvida these people will help them out which otherwise uh, you know we fail to do as a, as a industry we wanted these people to come on it start using counting their stocks and everything, but now because it is compulsory that if all the three party does not match, the transaction is not uh, able to happen. And because of that, these transporters as well as these retailers have to come on a digital platform. And uh, as the, if I, if I look at all your answers, except one bad news, which is for the trade is this 40%. And I hope yeah. if that also yeah. gets, you know, things are quite simple and simplified, including this composition scheme. Uh, barring one ambiguity, what you said regarding this 50-50 uh, control or administration over more than 1.5 crore uh, transaction or the or the sales turnover, this is still a little question mark that who will be handed over to whom? Because everybody otherwise would like to get handed over to the central uh, central um, um, uh, authority rather than state authority. But how do they divide is yet to be seen. So from our side, we profusely, infinitely thank you to make it so simple. I think all the points what you put on the on the presentation also were only operational. 
what what is needed to understand from by us otherwise volumes of books and volumes of literature we have read but this was quite nice and quite simple so thanks a lot from the whole community of uh, automotive thanks the et auto to put it so fast so the navel team and everybody really put it at the right time when we needed because we have only weeks left now to execute and we'll be in touch again as uh, it plays out thanks a lot dr thank you very much thanks a lot thank you thanks